The Night Beat starts right now. A late night hookups uncovered at one of San Antonio's largest school districts. The proof Northeast ISD says they have and who else the investigation involves coming up in a defender's report. But first we begin with breaking news tonight. A major shift in a shooting investigation. Police first called to what was described as a father turning the gun on himself. Now there is suspicion the son may have been the trigger man. The shooting happened on Lyric Avenue. That's on the city's southeast side, not far from South Cross and Goliad. Police say that they are responding to the call and that the man's son told the 911 dispatcher he shot his father. Investigators are now speaking with that suspect. We will continue to follow this story as it develops. Tonight's big story, masks no longer re recommended for those who are fully vaccinated. That's right. The CDC sharing the guidance today, but also making it clear there are some instances where masks can still be required. Many in San Antonio, though, sharing their reaction. I think it shows that things are improving, so that's wonderful. I personally myself feel more comfortable wearing it. And so I'm just going to stick with it until the, for the time being. I feel like the vaccine works. I am protected against it and I 100% I, uh, believe in it. So because of that, I don't I don't believe that I need to wear a mask. Doctors also feeling confidence in the vaccine. Metro Health Chief of Epidemiology, Dr. Rita Espinosa, says the guidance comes after more research among those who are fully vaccinated. Currently, the evidence is showing that even if an individual contracts the illness, they'll have a milder illness and that the possibility of them transmitting to others does not exist. So it really kind of minimizes the transmissibility to others. While the CDC offered guidance, the agency also says federal, state, local and workplace requirements would still need to be followed. Because of a travel mandate, mask wearing will still be enforced at the airport and on board planes. VIA is also still requiring masks on their buses. The Archdiocese of San Antonio says masks will still be required in churches, at least for now. Meanwhile, the city of San Antonio and Bear County officials set to discuss if they will continue mask requirements in their facilities. The night team's Jonathan Goto spoke with one business who is happy to hear the new guidance. President Joe Biden marking today a significant day since the start of the pandemic. The CDC issuing new guidance that would allow for those vaccinated to ditch their masks as well as social distancing. Some businesses already making the swift change and welcoming the significant update. We've been following the CDC guidelines throughout the, the pandemic and we're going to continue to do so now that we've got updates. Palmero says the new guidance is pretty simple and straightforward. His team of almost 18 personnel is almost all fully vaccinated and says they're all on the same page. So if you're fully vaccinated, you can come with without a mask and we'll have a sign that says that we recommend if you haven't been vaccinated to wear a mask. The new guidance comes as the CDC reports a downward trend on COVID-19 cases and scientific data that supports the vaccines are working, as well as an understanding of how the virus spreads. Palmetto says he's confident with the CDC's research. So we have thought about the scenario of potential customers saying that they're vaccinated and not being vaccinated. It would be my belief that the CDC has already considered that. But what if you as a business owner or employer want to mandate masks despite the CDC's new guidance? Legal experts say you can. I personally believe that they should allow any individual that wants to wear a face mask. By all means, you know, they should allow and encourage those individuals to do that. But for those individuals that have been fully vaccinated, I think the guidance today from the CDC certainly um, encourages those employers to allow individuals individuals to not wear face masks. Kubita also says that employers should provide clear and transparent communication regarding any changes in policy regarding this new guidance with employees. Now, it's also important to reiterate, as you already mentioned to ECs and Steve, the importance of wearing a face mask. It's also still required while traveling in a bus, train and any other public transportation. Reporting live, Jonathan Cotto, KSAT 12 News. Steve, ECs. Thank you, Jonathan. And while there are some who are excited to not wear masks, infectious disease Dr. Ruth Bergeron says there may be some benefits for those who choose to wear a mask in crowded venues. And let me tell you one more thing about why I still want to wear my mask when I'm in crowded indoor places. I've been amazed at how we got rid of the flu this year. It just went away. I hate getting summer colds. I don't want one. And I know if I wear my mask, 
when I'm around a lot of people, that that won't happen. As President Joe Biden says the new guidance marks an important milestone, he also urged citizens to treat those who continue to wear a mask with kindness and respect. Some may say, just feel more comfortable continuing to wear a mask. They may feel that way. We've had too much conflict, too much politicization of this issue about wearing masks. Let's put it to rest. The president also stressing the need to continue vaccinations. Here in Bear County, about 63% of people have one dose. 47.8% of those eligible are fully vaccinated. Children as young as 12 are now able to get the Pfizer vaccine, but parents or, or guardians will need to be on hand to provide consent. University Health already vaccinating children as young as 12. The Alamo Dome plans to begin offering vaccines to the new age group tomorrow. We have the growing list of places where children can get vaccinated on our website, ksat.com. New tonight, a new measure to ban abortions approved by Texas lawmakers. The proposal now being sent to Governor Greg Abbott. Texas law currently bans abortion after 20 weeks with exceptions. This bill would ban abortions after the first detection of an embryonic heartbeat. Technology can detect an electric flutter as early as six weeks, even though the embryo isn't yet a fetus and doesn't have a heart. Experts say women may not even know they're pregnant at that time. The measure would also allow private citizens to file civil lawsuits against doctors. If Abbott signs this latest measure, legal challenges are expected. A growing scandal tonight within the police department of one of San Antonio's largest school districts. A Northeast ISD officer and civilian employee forced to resign after an investigation found the couple using district email to arrange late night hookups. And it doesn't end there. As the night team's Dylan Collier reports, an associate superintendent has now resigned and the district's police chief remains the focus of a probe into his actions. It's tonight's Defenders Report. It started with an anonymous letter received last fall by the Northeast Independent School District Superintendent. Allegations that a security access technician with the district's police department was having a personal relationship with an officer during that officer's on-duty hours. There are more than 1,500 emails between these two employees. A subsequent inspection revealed the duo, Jessica Clary and Officer Josue Tarasas, used their district email accounts to arrange meetups for more than a year, often messaging one another in the middle of the night. The smoking gun for district officials officials, so to speak, this exchange in early April 2020. Clary writing just before 11 p.m. I would say come over, but I don't want you to get in trouble. After Tarasas responded that he was thinking about it, Clary answered, you can if you think you can get away with it. Hours later, now after 2 a.m., Clary writing, if you can't make it tonight, come over another night you're working. Tarasas, okay, I want to, but trying to figure out how to hide the unit. Clary telling him she can open a gate at her apartment that he can park on the back side of the building in a spot next to her car that would hide the patrol vehicle from view. Tarasas at 2.35 a.m. on my way from Lee, an apparent reference to one of the district's high schools. That was enough for us to um, confront him with that evidence and he did resign. Clary followed suit and when informing the district that her separation would take effect September 30th, wrote, quote, I think that it is best that I just remove myself from the situation and resign. Tarasas and Clary did not respond to requests for comment for this story. District leadership confirming both employees would have been terminated had they not stepped down. The district also issued Tarasas a general discharge, a red flag for any law enforcement agency that may hire him because it means he resigned while under investigation. Clary, the daughter of an NEISD associate superintendent, was given a much more graceful landing. NEISD police chief Wally McCampbell waited three whole days to reach out on Clary's behalf about another job, emailing a supervisor with the San Antonio Police Department's missing persons unit telling her that if given the opportunity, Clary would be an asset. 
days later, her father, Associate Superintendent Ron Clary, asking McCampbell for advice on whether it would be okay for Jessica to say she had frequent interaction with juveniles as part of her former position. SAPD officials confirmed Jessica Clary was interviewed a week later, but ultimately was not offered a position. Was your superintendent aware of the McCampbell, Ron Clary communications prior to us asking for those emails? No. Is he aware of it now? Yes. This was not something that should have happened, despite the fact that Mr. Clary was acting in the capacity of a dad just looking out for his daughter. Um, regardless, that email communication should not have happened. Ron Clary resigned a day before this interview took place, abruptly ending his 21-year career with NEISD. Nonetheless, it was still Campbell remains as chief, but continues to be the focus of a human resources investigation. District officials acknowledging he was not directed or coerced by Ron Clary to make the job recommendation. Is that appropriate behavior from him? Every individual supervisor has the right to decide whether to submit a letter of recommendation for a former employee, but it is safe to say that all aspects of this situation are under review currently. For the Defenders, Dylan Collier, KSAT 12 News. Jessica Clary is currently a cadet in the Alamo Area Law Enforcement Academy with an expected graduation date in early July. A spokesman for the Academy says they were unaware of the circumstances surrounding her departure from her last job. Still ahead on the night beat, a small city with big ideas. Balcones Heights hoping to team up with a local mall in a redevelopment plan. How it's expected to work coming up. And a bicyclist killed now questions over a possible plea deal after the death of Tito Bradshaw. The message one local councilman wants a judge and district attorney to hear before a ruling is made. It's next on the night beat. Concerns from a city councilman tonight. District 8 Councilman Manny Palaya is sending a letter to the district attorney and a judge in the case of Linda Collier Mason. The 69 year old accused of driving drunk then crashing into and killing bicyclist Tito Bradshaw. It's a story we've continued to follow since April of 2019. In the letter, Councilman Palaya says he believes a potential plea bargain could be in the works and urges a meaningful jail sentence in this case. The councilman writes, quote, the absence of jail time will communicate to all our neighbors and to Tito's little boy that the price of Tito's life was probation, end quote. We are still waiting to hear back from Mason's attorney. Her next court hearing is scheduled for Monday. You can read Polias's full letter right now on KSAT.com. The landlocked city of Balcones Heights hopes to avoid property tax rate increases by making some real estate investments. The city is working on a redevelopment plan with the owners of the Wonderland of the Americas Mall to bring in more revenue. The night team's Patty Santos tells us the agreement is not yet finalized, but it's generating a lot of interest. Ask Wonderland Mall of the Americas visitors and they'll tell you it's missing something. I like it actually. It's just, I'm thinking it needs more like a family oriented, like for kids. I like it. I go there uh, often, sometimes just to walk, have a walk, but um, it's not that busy. The city of Balcones Heights wants to fix that. We're a very small city, but we've got very big ideas. Limited by boundaries, but not by creativities. Balcones Heights city leaders are working on a proposal to buy 45% of the mall for $5 million from Crossroads Mall Partners, LTD. The city would have a community center inside the mall and a say in the redevelopment plans. And this is an opportunity for the city to find a, a, a very, um, profitable way to increase our revenue. More than $350,000 annually in new revenue, says Mayor Suzanne De Leon. The mall's managing partners say the agreement would provide long-term stability. The mixed use would continue, but they're looking at the, quote, addition of a market rate apartments project on a portion of the site sometime in the near future. The mayor is hesitant to talk about the specifics of their plan until the agreement with the property owners is finalized, which 
she hopes will be by this summer. It's a forward thinking risk they hope will bring long term sustainability and continued independence. We do not want to be annexed by San Antonio. We want to be our own city. Patty Santos, KSET 12 News. A community proposal meeting will be held on Wednesday the 19th at the Bijou Theater inside the mall at 6 p.m. The proposal would have to be approved by City Council before any revitalization gets underway. Let's take a live look outside Sky 12, our live cam picture tonight. Look at that, the flag and San Fernando Cathedral in the background. Beautiful night out there right now, Adam. Yeah, another beautiful night. Tomorrow's going to be another beautiful and quiet day. And then our active weather pattern, well, it resumes starting this weekend and especially into next week as well. Lots to talk about, so let's get right to it. The newest drought monitor is in. Really not a big change from last week because this does not take into account the rain that we had on Tuesday. A lot of rain, especially south of San Antonio, where we're still in the extreme and exceptional drought. Next week's drought monitor will take that into account and should show some good improvement. You look off to the west, West Texas, parts of the Panhandle, that's where we really need the rain as well. And our weather pattern is going to become more active and we'll start to put more dents in the drought in the days ahead. Our next weather maker, part of the next weather makers, is dip in the upper level flow, that little ripple in the flow, that's a little trough, and that's going to be our developing disturbance that's going to push our way. This weekend, we're expecting some scattered showers, but we're still just out ahead of the main energy, which is going to be over Southern California. Once we get into next week, that changes. Not only should we have some pretty good kick from this upper low, but also a lot of instability in the atmosphere. So next week is when we see the potential for severe storms to rise. So let's start with tomorrow. 0% chance of rain. We get into Saturday and Sunday. Pretty high chances there at 60%, but that does not imply that it's going to be all day Saturday and all day Sunday. We'll just have periods of showers and a few rumbles of thunder developing and coming and going periodically or intermittently through the weekend. We get into next week and that's where the severe potential rises again starting Monday, but I think especially into Tuesday and Wednesday and already we've got 60% chances right there. So that's really our next main focus in terms of potential severe weather into next weekend. Most of this week, this weekend should just be rain with a little bit of lightning and thunder. 60 in the morning today, 75 the high. Right now we're mostly in the 60s, still hanging on to some 70s farther south and west of San Antonio. Tomorrow morning, near 60. 62 Pleasanton. Meanwhile, 57 in Kerrville. And by the afternoon, I think we'll make it into the lower 80s around here. 81 Converse. 80 in Holotus. Bernie 79. 81 Stone Oak and La Soya at 82. Then we get into the weekend right near 80 with those periods of rain developing next week. The severe potential rises, high temperatures really maxing out in the upper 80s just on Monday. All right, thank you, Adam. All right, the highs and lows of the San Antonio Spurs season all in what, just a few hours tonight. So they're in the play-in tournament, and two things can happen there. They can play in to try and get into the playoffs, and now Pop can actually attend the enshrinement ceremony of Tim Duncan up in Connecticut. When we come back, the Spurs do clinch at least a play-in tournament berth. We'll show you how that happened, but they would need some help tonight. And high school baseball and softball playoffs this evening coming up. Spurs in New York still chasing to win the 10th and final playoff spot in the play-in tournament. Spurs look good early. Lonnie Walker, the four, with a quick first step to get into the lane and throw down the monster two-handed jam. DeMar DeRozan throwing it up to Drew Eubanks, who skies for the alley-oop. Spurs down two. Then Jakob Pertl caps off a 9-2 run with a hook in the lane and a two-point Spurs lead. Second quarter, Spurs dial it in from distance. Patty Mills knocks down the three. Then Rudy Gay for three, part of a 10-0 Spurs run. Spurs by one, 30-29. Then Keldon Johnson filling it up from the outside here to help get the good guys out to a five-point edge, but at the half, the Knicks would be back in the lead, 46-43. The Spurs could do no wrong and just start the third. DeMar gets the foul and banks home the jumper, then Kelvin going to the hoop and finishing with the acrobatic play-up. Uh, lay Spurs were red hot, going 16 for 16 field goals in the quarter, taking a 17-point lead, but then they go cold. Knicks finish the third on a 15-2 run. The Spurs lead is cut to four, going into the fourth. The Knicks have raced the Spurs 17-point lead in the fourth. 15 seconds to go. Spurs down four. Kelvin going base Baseline for the bucket.
Bucket and the foul. Lead cut to one, but the Spurs couldn't get any closer as the Knicks hit their free throw. Spurs lose by after leading by 17 in the third, 102 to 98. Pop says give the credit to the Knicks defense. You know, they're the best in the league right now in that respect. And uh, we were two for nine from three in that half, which didn't help. But, uh, you know, Randall got away from us. He made some great passes. Uh, and they shot, you know, close to 50% from three in that half. And that was that was the killer. Spurs will close it out at home, by the way, against Phoenix. Back-to-back -back games this weekend. With the loss in New York, the Spurs could still be back in that play-in tournament. They just needed some help from the Grizzlies to hand the Kings a loss tonight in Memphis. Grizzlies on the attack. Former Spur Kyle Anderson throwing it in from the baseline. Connects with Ja Moran on the alley-oop. Then Morant going right to the rim for the huge dunk. Memphis up three. Anderson with another assist. This time he finds Dylan Brooks for the three. The Grizzlies would be down one and a half and close on a 14-2 run. Kings fall 116 as the Spurs clinch the play-in tournament. Now, Tim Duncan will be inducted into the Nays Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame this Saturday in ceremonies held in Connecticut. His former teammate and current Hall of Famer David Robinson will introduce him at the induction. That will also include the late Kobe Bryant and Kevin Garnett. Duncan played all 19 seasons in the NBA with the Spurs and brought home five NBA championships and three NBA Finals MVP. The Spurs have put an exhibit up and a photo walk through the AT&T Center. You can share many of Timmy's accomplishments tomorrow from 2 to 7 p.m. at the AT&T Center. It was awesome. It brought back memories when uh, they were all playing Ginobili and Parker and Duncan. It was just like a great experience. Um, it brought back a lot of memories, especially from when I was little, just growing up and seeing like the Spurs and Tim Duncan win championships with Coach Pop and Manu Ginobili and Tony Parker. Just a lot of great memories and a lot of like my childhood. Changes in the Judson Independent School District next. Big changes in the Judson Independent School District. Rocket Girls head basketball coach Trita Corrales has been promoted to athletic director for the entire school district. She replaces Mike Miller, who is retiring. Corrales has been at Judson High School now for the past 11 seasons, leading the Rockets to the state semifinals the last five years into the state title in Class 6A in 2019. Now she's stepping away from coaching to enter administration, where her position as athletic director for the entire school district will include overseeing both the boys' and girls' athletic programs. I always knew the, the second phase of my career, I wanted to be an athletic director. That's something that I aspired to be. And just like sometimes as a basketball player or as a student, you have great teachers that influence you. I've had great athletic directors that have influenced me. And then I just wanted, I aspired to do what they did one day and to help coaches. To the diamond at the NAISD, Churchill hosting Lake Travis, second round of the 6A playoffs, top of the second, no score. Cavaliers, Marshall Preston sends this one back to the pitcher, Alex Honeyman, who almost gets his glove on it. That's an RBI single, 1-0 Lake Travis lead. Fourth inning now, Chargers down 4 nothing. Churchill's Garrett Reed hits it into a fielder's choice. Good enough to score Jacob Coolball and cut the Cavaliers' lead down to three, but it wasn't enough. Churchill falls 4-1, to one. game two is tomorrow. To softball, Connor facing Brennan in the third round of the 6A playoffs, top of the first. Brennan's Jaden Abrego with the blast of the gap between center and right that gets all the way to the wall. Isabella Hoon is on her way home. There's a throw to the plate, but it's wide, and she is safe. one nothing Bears in the process. Brenna's Ava Sanchez pulls this one down the left field line for the RBI single that scores Jacqueline Amadez, and it's 2 nothing Bears. Now, would roar out to a 3 nothing lead going into the bottom of the first. The Panthers start to attack, though. Jada Munoz blasts this pitch right up the middle. That will bring home Lehan Good, the Brennan lead is down to two, and O'Connor comes back to win at 63. Game two is tomorrow. Celebration of life is being planned for former UTSA and University of the Incarnate Word head basketball coach Ken Burmeister. Ken passed away on March 19, 2020, at the age of 72 after a bout with cancer. But due to the COVID-19 pandemic and shutdowns, last year his family decided to wait a year so they could honor Coach Burmeister. Ken was a college basketball coach for 21 seasons and is best known for his stints in San Antonio. Coach Burmeister posted 72 wins at UTSA from 1986 to 1990, leading the Roadrunners to their first ever NCAA tournament appearance and later an incarnate word where he roamed the sidelines for 12 years. That celebration of life will be held this Monday. A lot of friends coming into town for that big moment. Greg, we have about 10 seconds. Can you explain the play in tournament? Yes. <laughs> Tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Greg. We'll be right back. <laughs> That does it for the night beat. Don't forget, Good Morning San Antonio starts at 4.30. Good night.